Welcome to the Gentleman Badass Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Josh Kidney. With me, as always, two-time world champion Muay Thai fighter, the Emerald Mongoose himself, Mick Doyle. Mick, how are you? I'm great. I'm excited for our next guest. Excellent. Our guest today is Jeff Miller, the general manager for Fox 42 here in Omaha, Nebraska. We're going to talk to him a little bit about business. We're going to talk to him about the warrior mindset in business. Um, and really just interested in learning from him. So Jeff, thank you so much for being here today. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the Excellent. invite. I appreciate it, guys. So with all of our guests, just to, to start out, we like to get into the background. So uh, what you were like as a kid, uh, going through <laughs> school, all that stuff. Uh, le yeah, let's just start there. Okay. Take uh, us back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Close your eyes, if you will, please. Uh, you know, I, I actually uh, grew up in a small Midwest town in Indiana, uh, Newcastle, Indiana. Uh, small, 18,000 people, primary uh, primary employer in the town was a Chrysler plant. So literally like it, half the town worked at the, the Chrysler facility. So that gives you a pretty good idea that in the seventies and eighties, it was a very blue collar mindset. Mm -hmm. Somebody drive through town in a Toyota, it suddenly gets scratched up, you know, kind of, you know, Hey, buy American, be American. Territorial. Kind of <laughs> exactly. So, uh, you know, small town Midwest mentality. I grew up outside of that town a few miles. So, uh, between a, a hog farm and, and a cornfield, actually. And uh, um, I was the number three child of four. Um, and and uh, so 10-year-old or sister, eight-year-old or brother, myself, and then a six-year younger sister. Uh, so, uh, you know, middle child syndrome as well. Then uh, got picked on by some, then turned around and picked on somebody else. <laughs> so that's the way it works. Pay it forward. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just very simple, very moderate, you know, Midwestern upbringing. We... Uh, um, my dad uh, was a uh, he, he was a multitude of things. He was an entrepreneur um, and had his own business, everything from welding to plumbing. But his primary business was a septic tank cleaning service. Hmm. And so, uh, yeah, he just he hauled around other people's shit and uh, <laughs> got paid for it. And my mom was a uh, teller at a bank in town. And that was about the extent of it. And my younger sister and I, we were latchkey kids. We took care of ourselves after school. And uh um, that, that's pretty much what we did. Parents got divorced when I was a teenager. Um, dad had some issues and, you know, that's probably what part of my mindset. But, uh, at the end of the day, um, my mom was a saint and my dad was someplace inside of all of that. But yeah, we, uh, it's taken me many years to figure that out mm. too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yeah. then school, were you a good student, bad student? What did that look like? Uh, you know, I was, uh, I got good grades, uh, and it came easy. And I paid for that later. Uh, and uh, I was actually, uh, I started, I was wrestling in, uh, in, in early on and, and doing a lot of uh, competitive sports kind of thing. But wrestling was my primary. Uh, then injured my back and uh, wore a back brace for six months. So kind of dropped out of that. And I had a talent for music. So got into music. Uh, and then basically, um, you know, kind of stayed with the music end of things, dropped out of the sports side of it. And uh, in, in, in my high school, uh, it, which the, the claim to fame from Newcastle, Indiana, is that we have the largest high school field house in the world to watch basketball. The town has 18,000 people. The gym holds 10,000 people. <laughs> and they would sell it out. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so basketball night in Indiana, shit, yeah, you're going to a game. And it was full. Um, so, but I was there, but I was in a band playing at that point. <laughs> what you what, playing? Yeah, what instrument? Uh, at the time, I was playing trumpet. But uh, as the years progressed, I ended up playing trumpet, trombone, learned saxophone, uh, learned the drum, then uh, later on taught myself harmonica. And I'm trying to learn the guitar right now, but, you know, not awesome. as focused as I should well, be. Well, he's the guy. Yeah. Yeah. I the I'm also a former trumpet player. Oh, yeah. I, I did trumpet and French horn, trumpet for pet band, yeah. French horn for concert band. Yeah. Same fingerings, a little bit different timber, but... Uh, Okay, so you were you were a band nerd like me. I actually I, I quit yeah. all all sports my sophomore year to yeah. play to play music. My my passion was guitar. Um, I did band all the way through high school, but yeah, I really got into guitar. Yeah. And, uh, I wish I learned how to play harmonica. That would be a blast because <laughs> I could have one. You could have one in your pocket and you can just pull uh, it out and absolutely. Uh, oh yeah. One of these days, I'll have to try that. You gotta <laughs> do a lot of tongue wagging with that though, and. 
Yeah, well, you know what? That pays off in other ways yeah. somewhere down the line, too. Okay. But yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no. Wait, what? <laughs> Hang on a minute. So we'll you mean later. the bazookie's no good? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shit. So... All right, so that was that was high school. What did what did college look like for you? Uh, well, you know what? It started off um, it started off great actually. Um, uh, the the problem was in high school things came a little too easy for me, uh, so I didn't have the 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 work um, or the uh, the drive to make an effort. I ended up going to uh, going to Purdue University to be an aeronautical engineer, um, and uh, was a Marine ROTC option. Um, in Marine Navy ROTC option midshipman there at Purdue for one year and loved it. Uh, loved the Marine. Um, my, that was very much part of the mindset there. Did that uh, just was crazy awesome. Problem was the other side of that coin was I found out I hated math. Mm. And to be an aeronautical engineer at Purdue University, you kind of need yeah. math. It's important. Yeah. So um, they uh, at the end of that year, Let's just say the university and I agreed to part ways. <laughs> <laughs> the mutual consent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, my biggest regret probably is having to drop out of that uh, that pro, the, uh, Marine ROTC program and and, lo- and leave the other midshipmen behind. That being said, uh, took a semester off from school and uh, went to work for my dad's business, being a septic tank cleaning. Um, uh, just you know, a guy who would go out and clean septic tanks, mm. and in that. So that, you were a, a mechanical engineer, an aeronautical, aeronautical engineer. engineer, and then yeah. you became a feces engineer. That's right? pretty just, much exactly uh, correct. Just trying to get that right. <laughs> that's exactly right. Is that what you called yourself? Yeah, yep, that's <laughs> I'm right. A, I'm an environmental engineer. Uh, I was no. a used food consultant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, and then in that time, I, I was kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do, and a buddy of mine, uh, who actually sold radio at the time, um, asked me. He goes, "Hey, you know." why don't you come out with me and, and, and just see what I do for the day? Uh, went out with him and it was like this huge light clicked on in my life and uh, um, decided that's what I want to do. So I transferred to Ball State University and uh, majored in radio television management. Wow. And that is what my bachelor's degree is in, in radio television management. Um, I fell in love with that. I worked at radio stations and worked at the local TV station there in town. Um, that's that's pretty much like that was my gig. So I literally worked at a radio station um, part-time at, or I volunteered at the TV station, then worked at a janitor's cleaning service at 4 a.m. in the morning before classes start, before all that other stuff happened. Um, so, and that, that was kind of the rest of my college career because I realized if this didn't work out, I was going to have to go back and mm. clean shit for a living. Wow. And <laughs> you know what? Any day doing that other stuff was yeah, better than right. that. So you're saying there's some value in working a crappy job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Literally. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, my next question then was, I was going to ask how you got into television. Obviously, that that's what you graduated with. How did you end up kind of breaking into the industry and getting to where you are today? Yeah. Um, interesting and somewhat long story, and I'll, I'll abbreviate it for you. But uh, after uh, you know, I'd worked in radio and some other um, and some other things. Then uh, also took some time. I took a semester off, went to Walt Disney World, and worked at Walt Disney World for that time. Um, at the end of the day, I, I love the radio and television aspect because, at heart, I'm a marketer. I love taking other you know people's businesses or even my own and building it up, growing it, getting creative, and just kind of selling that sizzle and, and marketing the business. Um, so. So that being the case, uh, I, I excelled in that program, and uh, one of the, uh, the the department chair for um, the telecommunications department was served on the board for um, Saga Broadcasting and said, uh, I'd like for you to come work at one of our stations. So I started talking to some of his television stations and ended up at a radio station in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, that was kind of the kickoff to the entire career program. I worked in radio for a couple of years there, then jumped over to television in Milwaukee, um, then uh, was in television for three or four years there, then uh, made the jump, got recruited to San Antonio, Texas at a television station, was in San Antonio for five years. Uh, then uh, made the jump to um, Jackson, Mississippi, and was in television in Jackson, Mississippi for three years, two weeks, and two days. Uh, the reason I know that is because, uh, well, let's just say Mississippi is not a state. It's a club. 
<laughs> and uh, um, and I have a good friend of mine who still lives there said that to me, and uh, and unfortunately, I was never going to be a member of that club. So, mm. so were you always uh, behind the camera I, in all yeah, this, or did yeah. you ever like? Did you ever think, man? I want to get out there. I want to, or did you always like see your role behind the scenes? I am. I've, I've always considered myself a behind the scenes person. Um, I've always been uh, either the sales guy or the sales manager or, you know, a, a now the general manager. Um, I could produce stuff with me in front of it every single day right now. I don't. Um, one, I think other people are better at it than I am. Uh, and I don't kid myself about that Two, That's not where my talent is. Uh, and three, I just don't like the way I look on camera. <laughs> hey, you're on, you're on camera yeah, There's right a reason now. I don't look yeah. at it. You know, right I'm looking at you guys instead. So, uh, yeah, no, always in sales or management positions through all of those. I went from, uh, after I left Jackson, I went to Orlando, Florida, um, and then was in Orlando, Florida for a couple of years. And then, uh, um, got a call to come to Omaha, Nebraska. And, uh, um, I said, you know what? Yeah. You know what? I, it's time for a change. Uh, and, uh, uh, I picked up that phone call and a couple of weeks later I was headed towards Omaha and I thought I'd move to Omaha and be here two or three, four years. That was 14 years ago. Wow. So, um, fell in love with the place, love it here, love the people, um, uh, married house, kids, the whole deal. So I'm anchored in for a while. Done. <laughs> yes. He's here. He's stuck. That's so right. that all, that all happened in Omaha then you met your yes. wife and all that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So. Day to day, um, general manager for a TV station. What does that look like? You know, the the most interesting part about it is, you know, my job is to the number one job of a general manager is to protect the license, right? You know, protect the FCC license because that's that's the license that allows us to operate. Now, that as long as you're having a good day or a decent day is an easy job, but then you have a staff then you have all of the various departments setting a vision for them setting the goals uh, and and then putting in systems and, and and procedures that monitor all of that then at the same time operating the business making sure we got revenue coming in and on our expenses aren't out of whack um, at the end of the, and then the most important you know resource and asset that we have is the people and making sure that you create a culture that is not only collaborative, but constructive, um, but at the same time is challenging so that people are growing all the time and and keeping them at the forefront of of our philosophy, or at least my particular philosophy is a big part of that. Um, I think it pays off in the sense that I don't have a lot of turnover, but at the same time, my operation is a little different. And um, so I need to make sure that I try to create a culture that not only attracts people or allows me to attract people, but keeps them on board once they're on board. Hmm. Um, and it, and it's worked out well. My job is a little bit of everything. Um, and if, but if I'm, if everybody's doing their job right, I shouldn't have to do much, but at the same time, um, I also had the philosophy of uh, a little like a, a Navy ship. In fact, look, it, you know, if the toilet's not working on the, the fourth deck, that's still the captain's problem. Well, guess what? Something's not working mm. in the building. Something's not working someplace. That's my problem. Yeah. I got to get it fixed. So it, it kind of gives you an idea. I hope maybe of, it's, yeah. it's a little bit of everything um, and then hopefully a whole bunch of nothing. So if a good day is protecting the FCC license, what's a bad day then? <laughs> How, what what yeah. constitutes a bad day <laughs> in a TV station? Yeah, there's there and there and there happen. You know, uh, if, you know, the easy, you know, the easy answer to some of those, you know, you got bad revenue or or all of a sudden you go off air, which has happened, or all of a sudden, you know, we can't do a newscast for some reason and you got to figure out how to make that happen. Um, bad days have included, you know, I've got stellar employees who leave. Well, that's a bad day. Um, I've got other employees who are arguing. Well, now I'm the mediator of the group and I've got to figure out how this is going to work and, and what's going to happen then too. Um, Bad day can be a variety of different things. Um, I was manager of a TV station on 9-11. That was a bad day. Mm. That was a day where, you know, what do you do? And uh, you're not sure what's happening and what's going on. At the, you know, when or or the shooting at Von Mar. That was a bad day at a TV station. Mm. Were you in Omaha when that happened? Uh, I was, actually. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the kind of things that you're trying to inform the public and, and make sure that everybody is 
aware of everything they need to, but at the same time also be sensitive to the fact that, you know, people are dying. And, yeah. you know, how much do you take the camera and put it in somebody's face? And how much, how many resources do you commit to doing a particular, you know, story versus just telling what's out there and, and just letting people experience it as well, too? Um, it, you know, a bad day can be a variety of different things. Um, but at the same time, you just, you kind of roll with those punches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm hearing a couple different things here. Um, so number one, you're talking about if there's a job that needs to be done, even if it's fixing a toilet, right? Yeah, absolutely. We've talked, we, 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 we've talked about leadership uh, on this podcast before. It's not specifically about leadership, but we've talked about how, you know, a leader is what their organization needs them be needs them to be when they need them to be it. Uh, yes. If you kind of distill it down into a sentence. And so number one, like, that's really neat for me to hear because it sounds like you'd be a pretty good guy to work for. Number two, um, you know, just it being in the media uh, and all that you're kind of juggling along those lines. And I, I guess I'd never thought about that. There's somebody in charge that has to decide what, um, what to put on the air and has to balance those different aspects of being sensitive to what's going on as well as trying to report the news versus or, or even trying to put an opinion out. Now, would you say in your business especially, like, is that standard? Like, are, are the other general managers for the other TV stations thinking the same thing? Uh, or are you kind of an outlier? Uh, you know, I, I can't necessarily speak for them. I have a lot of friends who are general managers, obviously. And, um, and so in looking at those situations, every situation is different. Um, some general managers are going to be more involved in, in, in the newscast. Some are going to be less involved. There are stations that don't have a news at all. So uh, it's more of just a business operation. Well, that's, that's still got a, a slew of people involved. Um, at the end of the day, for me, though, in comparison to some of the other friends of mine that are general managers, you, you have to just kind of balance you know, what the demands of the day are in that sense. But at the same time, keep everybody moving in the same direction with the same vision and the same long-term goals mm. and, and, and balance that. So is, is the, you know, it, for instance, here in Omaha is the CBS station, you know, they're going through changes right now. Are they handling things the same way as the ABC station? No, not at all. But at the same time, they're in a different growth period of, of where they are in their, their life cycle, as it were. Uh, and, you're going to have to handle those changes differently. Yeah. And in, in the eight years I've been the general manager of this operation, um, we've seen multiple life cycles and you just have to adjust and flex. But that's also being you know, a business operator, is being able to understand where you are, where you want to go, and how do I get this entire team of people all in the same direction, um, sometimes with less people, sometimes with more people, but figuring out what, what it is you need to do and get us, get everybody in that direction. Excellent. So as part of uh, what you do, hiring, firing, are you a part of that process? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cause uh, when I was talking with Mick about what we wanted to talk about on this podcast, he gave me some examples of, of questions. And one was um, like, what trends do you see in the new millennial workforce? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see that they're doing well? And what do you see there that they're doing poorly? Well, that's it's an interesting question, um, and there are some very, very talented people out there in the in the millennial workforce. And you know, I think, and I'll, I'll stereotype them a little bit in the sense of, um, yeah, I think there, you know, there's a sense of entitlement there. But with every pro or with every con, there's also a pro, and that means that you know, some of these folks are um, very much in tune with a self awareness of the things that they want out of life. Um, my, in retrospect, I look back at when I was their age and, um, I wasn't nearly as self-aware as some of the, some of the millennials are. Um, so, you know, they know what they want. Maybe, you know, today it's not money. I would rather spend time with my dog. Okay, cool. But you at least know that. Um, and I think they've got the, they've, they've broken the, the barriers of saying, you know, I can, I can choose what I want as, as a millennial. Um, the downside to that is, and I think maybe it's the entitlement or, or some of the other things is they, they don't necessarily want to listen to, um, experience and they don't you know, they think they know it and okay, that's great. I probably thought the same thing too, when I was, you know, a, a younger, um, but to that extent, I, you know, 
why well, I still think I know everything right now. I yeah, mean, yeah. Um, but I, I, the, the challenge with some of the millennials is um, keeping them engaged because they have such a short attention span. Mm. Um, and, and keeping that, and then that is something that we also have to look at when we're programming a television station of, uh, you sitting, looking at the programming to say, okay, yeah, how am I going to capture some of these folks who, you know, they're not interested in, in watching the same programs that their parents watched at the same time. They're also not watching it on a big screen. They're watching it on a camera or, mm. I mean, a, on a, on a cell phone. Yeah. So, I mean, at the end of the day, you, you got to think about them from a lot of different perspectives and try to understand what it is that they're interested in. Um, and kind of have to engage them on that level. And that's not a bad thing, but it's also very challenging. And I think, you know, I'm a Gen Xer, um, but I acted a lot more like a boomer uh, in that sense. And, you know, because I was, I was younger, but I was raised by a lot of folks who were older. And so I, I, I still struggle with that communication level of especially Gen Xers. So you know, in your career, you – You've obviously moved quite a bit. Yeah. Is that the norm in TV and radio that you bounce around different markets? Or, you know, because one of the problems I see with, with younger kids is that they're, you know, we've, we've touched on it. They have this limited attention span, limited ability to kind of stay in one spot for a long time and they mm -hmm. bounce around. Mm -hmm. If moving around is kind of, endemic to your industry then how does that work for them if they can't sit still anyway do, are they drawn to a job like that or do you even have to move around is it necessary or it helps okay it helps a lot um especially in you know if you if you want to make a forward progression in your career being able to move that helps a lot uh and i was very very driven towards wanting to proceed my career forward um the and in, for instance, and I'll give you a perfect example. Um, we're looking for multimedia reporters, um, you know, and we're always on the search for multimedia reporters. Finding those here in Omaha is is a bit of a challenge, or even getting them and, and recruiting them out of Lincoln, coming out of uh, uh, University of Nebraska, uh, is a challenge. So we end up having to hire a lot of very young new reporters, maybe right out of college, maybe with a year or two's of experience, um, and move them in from out of market because. My particular news operation gives them a lot more experience than another more traditional news operation. And so we utilize that to recruit them, to bring them here, to say, you're going to get a lot of experience, but you got to move here. And it severely limits a lot of folks. Um, part of it, especially on the news side, is one, everybody wants to work for ESPN right out of high school or right out of college. And that's 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 not going to happen. You got to put in your dues at least at some point or another. And if you're going to put in your dues, if you're going to stay in the same location, it's going to take you longer. But if you move around, you get different experiences, different operations, and you build a reputation that way much faster. So it allows you to exceed. Same thing in my career. I moved around. I built a reputation, saw a lot of different things. I've worked at Fox's, ABC's, CBS's, uh, I mean, all different formats, all, you know, I've, I've got a lot of different experiences in that sense. So it allowed me to, it showed that I was flexible, but at the same time allowed me to understand a lot of different perspectives when I settled into this particular market. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay, absolutely. good. So kind of along those lines of, of hiring again, um, this is another question that Mick said I should ask. Uh, what's your opinion <laughs> on the value of college degrees versus work experience? You know, it, it was interesting. I was, I was kind of thinking about um, a similar kind of situation. I, I, I do not think that everyone needs a college degree. And I think it's there is a... Um, we're doing a disservice by trying to encourage everyone to go get a college degree and everybody needs to go to college and we need to make college free. I think that's an absolute disservice. I mean, in the sense that even now only one in three people have a college degree and it's pretty easy to go to college. Uh, 10 years ago, that was only one in four. So you're seeing an uptick in that sense of it. But then how many people are settled with this huge amount of college debt working in a job that doesn't relate to their college degree? And, and it just doesn't make sense. So, I, you know, the world needs a lot of other people and a lot of jobs. And some of the jobs that I employ for that we look for college degrees, 
don't need a college degree. Mm-hmm. You so don't. Did, I mean, who decides that you need a college degree? Is it, is it higher ups in the company that have college degrees? or? <laughs> um, not necessarily, but it's just so much easier to put that filter in when you're looking for applicants to say, oh, a college degree, you know, uh, or you know, minimum education experience, college degree, that kind of stuff, uh, just to kind of filter out some folks. Because look, can anyone be a reporter if they have talent? Yeah, if they have the talent for it. But I think, you know, have knowing that they took the classes and they've spent some time and they've made that dedicated effort to going through the process is a nice qualifier. Mm-hmm. Um, if I, you know, but I would also, when we hire salespeople, you know what? You don't need a college degree to, 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 to sell television. It helps. It makes you a better marketer. It shows me that you can be professional and, and those kind of things. But some of the best sales guys I've ever seen, they barely got out of high school, <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. You know, and, and that's okay um, because they understand people and they have talents. College doesn't give you talents and it doesn't do anything towards letting you – just because you spent the time on something doesn't mean you've earned the right to move on even forward. There's no senior, uh, you know, seniority level as you come out of college. You kind of have to start over. So people who do, oh, I have to go to college. Well, no, not necessarily. And I've got a 16-year-old daughter right now who's brilliant when it comes to math and, and chemistry and all this other stuff. And, you know, and she's like, well, you know, I got to think about colleges, but she doesn't want to think about colleges. And you know, we're, we're talking about a lot of different things, but I'm not pushing on her. What college are you going to go to? Where are you going to go? That kind of stuff. It's what do you want to do? What do you – what – is your passion. What are the things that you're going to love to do? Now, if college is involved in that, great. But if not, yeah, I'm not going to sweat it too much either. Yeah. That's one thing I've I kind of found in my own life. I, I was a stockbroker and investment advisor for about eight years. Yeah. And I just remember at one point I was sitting there doing the same exact job as a guy that had a master's degree. And I'm about a six time college dropout. I think I've gone back about six times. And, <laughs> yeah. and you know, I, when I was going to school, I wish I would have known you know, then what I know now. And if I was going to school again, I would actually be going to classes that interested me um, versus classes that I thought I had to take, right? right? Because there's so many classes. I, I even pull up the Metro uh, Community College thing and look, oh, it'd be great to take a class on graphic design or creative writing yeah. or any of this stuff. Um, and I wish I would have had that same mentality other than, okay, you're going to take these four um, gen eds that you have to take to get out of the way. And yeah. Honestly, that's what killed one of my semesters. I had to take four gen eds. I hated them all, mm-hmm. and I was—I mm-hmm. just got sick of college and left. Understand. Yeah, I, I kind of looked out because I, you know, obviously when I emigrated over here, I came here to go to college. You're, um, not, you're I, not from the U.S.? No, uh-huh. no, a little <laughs> further east. Mm-hmm. And um, but I'm in I'm in college, and I'm studying exercise science and English, and all of a sudden, just to look right place, right time, I get offered the job that I'm going to school for. Oh, wow. Uh, I get offered the uh, a job at St. Joseph's Center for Mental Health as a fit, uh, fitness coordinator. Actually, he was a fitness instructor first. So I'm two and a half years into school. I'm not like, you know, buried with that, but it, it's like, it, it's on the horizon. I can see it. And I was like, hang on a minute. I'm going to fucking go two and a half more years, rack up more debt, And like, this is the job that I'm going to school for. And these guys don't seem bothered that I haven't finished school. Now, you know, that was 1980, what was that? 88, different time, you know, I don't know. Like I look at my own kids, I don't see them ever getting kind of an opportunity like that now. I think you probably have to have a degree. And then just, you know, by look, attrition, hard work, whatever, You know, I end up becoming the coordinator there and then get recruited away to a hospital, which is like my dream job. And and I still haven't had to go back to school. And I'm thinking, shit, this is this is awesome. But then I get my first child that's college age and I'm like, right, you're going to college. Right. (laughs) I don't know why. I don't know why I forced them to. My, you know, my eldest son couldn't. He he just wasn't interested. Right. My middle son, very bright. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I want to go to college. And I was like, you should go to Colorado because Colorado is gorgeous. And he's like, yeah, that sounds great. So we ship him off to Colorado. He does something he hates doing. Right. Ends up quitting. And now we're paying off student debt. Uh, And I'm thinking, 
what the hell? Like, I didn't make that mistake. What the hell? But I just felt like, well, it's the right thing to do. Like, you're supposed right. to go to college. Oh, yeah. And I think it's easy to kind of get in that trap uh, yeah. unless you have some other viable skills that you can kind of bring to the forefront well, and, and, and you execute. Know, yeah, right. for my job, you know, on the on the application or whatever, on the, the job listing, it said college degree required. Now, the way that I got around that, I, I had a little bit of luck and then also a little bit of skill was involved because I, I ended up meeting um, uh, an assistant manager and I was friends with an assistant manager at the company. And so networking, uh, yeah, absolutely. you know, and I, I was not good at networking at the time, but we were friends, right? And that's, that's networking in and of itself. So he recommended me for the job at the time they needed people really bad right and so you know i i at least had to do well in the interview did well enough that they hired me they might have hired everybody because honestly <laughs> my class for the series seven was 40 people yeah and we had for the first five or six weeks we were studying eight hours a day for the series seven and by the end of that class uh after the seven only eight of us were left wow only eight of us passed the seven on the first time nice. and so you know That's i had tough. to kind of put in my dues and study and and do all that but the only reason i got in the door was because i had uh you know a network a guy that could actually right that was working for the company that was anyway yeah. so <laughs> well i will tell you i mean like i look back at my bachelor's degree and i'm like i wish i would have taken more like accounting classes and mm. uh more legal classes and just you know to be aware of it but one of the best classes i took was a golf class, right? Because I've done more business on the golf course. Mm. With you spend four, five, six hours with a guy, have a couple of beers, you get a relationship, you do good business there. Yeah, right. But if I sucked at golf, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So, I mean, just little dumb things like that. But those are the kind of things that later on you look back and go, "Damn, I'm glad I did it." Now, if I found a university that offered a master's degree in golf, I would fucking <laughs> go back to school right now. See, I've avoided golf like the plague. I just know that my thing is I can't do anything casually. So as soon as I start oh, playing yeah. golf and caring, I'm going to be miserable because I'm going to have to just play. Look what happened to me. Yeah. I, I just start playing golf. Like I kind of dabbled with it every now and again. But yeah, everybody seems shocked that I'm from Ireland. They're like, you don't golf? And I was like, man, you got to be rich to golf in Ireland. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no kidding. But I just recently got into it. And I have you know a group of friends, uh, especially there's, a, there's a, a guy from Ireland and a guy from Scotland. And we got we golf now. This last year, we, we golf quite a bit. And it's fucking hilarious. And uh, I mean, my sides are sore from laughing. Um, and then the people that we meet out on the golf course, the networking and stuff like that. And um, I actually, I never thought I'd see myself golfing, but I actually, uh, I'm kind of falling. I'm becoming an addict. Well, I think I, I know one of the guys you played with, Clive. And yeah. just, you know, playing with him is hilarious anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Clive is this, uh, I'll shout out to my yeah. buddy, Clive Howard. He's a guy from Dublin who came over here to be a bartender at the Brazenhead Irish pub. Yeah. Like when, when the owners of the Brazenhead bought this Irish pub in a box package, part of the deal was, hey, we're going to get you staff from Ireland too. So it'll be this authentic Irish pub, and 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 we've been, we've been buddies since, and uh, yeah, he's a he's a character. Yeah, yeah. We should get him one yeah. day. We should get him Let's on the it. podcast too. And Let's do it. I of, definitely will tune into that bunch one. Of immigrants. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Nobody will understand what you're talking about. We, we may have to do that podcast in the founders' room. <laughs> yeah, bar go, just right. so you yeah know. with some beers. It could get oh, sloppy, yeah. but it could that be fun. like a blast. Yeah. That could be a new a new series that we you know drunken yeah, exactly. drunken Irish yeah, conversation podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> Write that down, Josh. Had, We're going to do it. Had a few beers with Clyde yeah. myself. So, yeah. so kind of transitioning <laughs> from that, you're you're successful with your business career, right? Mm. Um, moving to Omaha, but it seemed like things were potentially starting to fall apart, or at least get shaky uh, outside of business. And tell me a little bit about that, and then what it was that kind of turned that around for you. Well, it was. I, I think you're you're talking specifically about Wake Up Warrior and how I get Correct, into that. Yeah. Program. Okay. Um, yeah. No, I think that. Well, I mean, I. A little backstory. I mean, I have two, you know, two things that I like to say. I mean, I have an, you know, an addictive personality and a short attention span. So when I find something I like, I do it crazy for maybe a year or two, and then I find something else and I move on. So, you know, I got into scuba diving. I, I became a dive master. Um, I uh, um, got into uh, some shooting, and then I've taken that to a level of tactical shooting and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, 
got my master's degree a few years ago. Um, it's like, oh, this is kind of interesting and got a master's degree in negotiation and um, dispute resolution. So, you know, a lot of different things. So, but I, I finished out that um, I had been married a year or two, uh, got some younger kids, a, a, a 16-year-old, five-year-old, and a two-year-old. And about, uh, about a year or so ago, you know, I think all businessmen at some point or another, um, especially if you've experienced some level of a success and, you know, you maybe start to get a little bored or you feel like, you know, I just maybe there's something else. I just I don't feel like I'm accomplishing enough or um, I'm just not feeling it. And I started getting into my own head at that point. And John Maxwell is one of my favorite authors, um, writes that executives uh, fail because of the four A's, uh, either arrogance, aloneness, adventure seeking, or what is the last one? Mm, I can't remember it offhand. I'll think of it here in a second. Um, adultery. That's the other one. And I looked at those four and I said, I don't want to fuck anything up. And I want to stay away from those four. And then crazy enough, one, um, one particular day, I, I'm on social media, as everybody is, and I'm streaming through, and all of a sudden, this uh, this ad pops up for uh, Wake Up Warrior with a gentleman by the name of Garrett White, and literally starts just saying all the things that I've been thinking about. I feel like I'm stuck. I feel like I need a new challenge. Things aren't going right, you know, maybe at the office or things just don't, you know, it wasn't like I was having problems with my marriage, but just didn't feel like we were kind of hitting on all cylinders. Um, and he was addressing every single one of those concerns. And I'm like, yeah, this is kind of interesting. Um, and then he starts talking about Warrior Week, and he, he brings in a group of guys and trains them for a week and then um, goes through a very in-depth process. Uh, and, then I, and then he said, well, if you're not able to do Warrior Week, maybe you're interested in you know the Warrior's Way through Wake Up Warrior and this entire process. So then, uh, so I did a little research on him, found out a little bit more about him, and, he, and find out he has written a book called The Warrior Book. And this is basically kind of the the Bible or guide or instruction manual for the entire belief system and what we call operating system that is the warrior's way. Uh, and for me, it clicked. All of that just kind of fell together because I was never, you know, you're we're taught as men, you know, you there's two things to do. You either get paid or get laid. That's it. That's that's what you're supposed to do, and you're and we've not been taught necessarily what it's like to really be a man, and part of that is because our fathers weren't taught how to be a man by their fathers, and a lot of that stems back going all the way to the industrial revolution. Before the industrial revolution, we spent time with our dads out in the field or doing whatever, mm -hmm. chopping wood, that kind mm -hmm. of stuff, and we spent more time that way. And fathers passed on what it was to be a man and how to be a man. And we've lost that. So I don't blame my dad or even my grandfather, or that kind of stuff. I really just say they didn't know any better. So it's just a, a, a culture and societal thing. Well, this kind of puts things back in place. And for me, the warrior's way coming from the warrior book by Garrett White just made a lot of sense. And it breaks your life down into four areas, um, body, being, balance, and business. Body, obviously, pretty straightforward. But your being is your your own mindfulness and what's going on in your head and, and how you approach life and your belief system and whether that's in God or or not, but how that how that works within yourself. Um, let's see, body being balance, that is your relationship with your specifically with your wife and family, with your wife and kids and what that's like. And if you're not married, those people that you care about in your life. Um, but finding balance with that. And then lastly, business, because ultimately that is what really a lot of men find their value in. But the problem is, and how many businessmen do you know who either put all their time and effort and energy into the business and then regret, you know, neglect their balance or their body or even their being. Um, you know, they spend so much time at work that they're not at home. Well, you got to find, you got to put the same effort into all of them. Now it can be, you know, it can change on a daily basis or weekly basis, but finding a way to make all four of those work for you every day. And that's mm -hmm. the hard part, not just five days a week, 
every single day. Mm-hmm. No. All of all of that, and I'll wrap up. But I mean, all of that just made sense to me, and it just started clicking. And once you start getting into it a little bit more and understand what it is and how it is, and then the work you have to do behind it then it becomes kind of that belief and operating system that you kind of go, yes, this makes me want to be a better person. So what happens to the old Jeff Miller? Well, and that's a great question because part of the process of this is the old Jeff Miller has to die. That guy who's this big today, or or maybe the guy when I started warrior a year or so ago, uh, maybe I was this big. Um, and I wanted to be bigger, but I didn't know what. Well, part of that process is goal setting to say, I want to be this big and then setting goals to get there. And every single one of those is on a you know 90 day challenge or even each month, week, or even days. And every single day you have your own challenge that you set and you have to get through. But ultimately what occurs is that Jeff Miller that starts to become the bigger one, this guy's got to die. And let's say it takes a year to get to this bigger Jeff Miller. Well, guess what? This guy has to get to a bigger Jeff Miller who's this big. And then, and in that evolution and growing and expansion, and that's ultimately what this is about is expansion. It's expansion in your body, being, balance, and business and continue to get bigger. But you have to kill off the old ways of thinking that got you where you were. My problem was that I I would been pretty successful and I was pretty happy about it, but I knew something was missing. When I realized what it was and how I got to where I was was great, but if I wanted to get bigger, better, expand, I needed to change what got me here and get better at all of these other things to get even more where I wanted to be. So you're constantly kind of upgrading your operating system yes with the help of <laughs> of this program yeah that's really what it comes down to and and ultimately um the biggest impact is obviously it, the easy impact is on the body side of it uh and i and i and i fight and struggle with that on it every single day um but where it's i saw instant I mean, instant impact was in the balance side uh you know my my little kids and little kids are easy but they just instantly connected with you know me taking the time every single day to make an investment in them. Even if it's just small little thing like writing a post-it note and sticking it on their door. You know, and and they can't even read even, but they know something is there and daddy wrote me a note and I'll read it to them or their mom, you know, or my wife will, the, but that kind of thing. So where I saw huge leaps in my life was in my balance part of it. And then I realized that's my purpose. I, that's what drives me. Cause when I saw those leaps, I went, Oh my God, this is awesome. This is the coolest thing. And I had better business days and I wanted to work out better. Why? Cause I want to live longer to be with this family that much more. Um, and in my being, I was just a better place overall, but you start investing into these four B's and you start to see the expansion pretty quickly. Now there are days where, you know, you've kind of fallen that pit and you struggle through it. And that's why we have to say, you have to do the fucking work every day. When I joined the program, 500 guys joined with me. There's about 30 of us left. Wow. There are, have been um, probably about 5,000 guys who've joined Warrior over the last five years. And there's maybe only about 1,000 of us in total still left because it's hard. But at the end of the day, it's because it's a mindset and a belief system that you have to just get your head around and say, I've got to do this. I'm doing it for me, but I'm also doing it for every other part of my life too. So it's it's basically just a process and falling in love with the process. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so I've seen those I've seen those advertisements on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Now is that you say the program that's kind of like a subscription thing, or do you pay one upfront thing, or how, how does that work? They've they've got a couple of different levels, um, and it and the the entire program is it's been interesting because it's changed about every two or three months because I think they're just continuing to tweak it gotcha. to make sure it fits right. Um, the entry program that I went through was called King's Kit, and uh, it's a four week. 30 day program that you kind of get into all of it is done online and, and it's very engaging in that sense. Um, and that being said, you, you go through each and every week, you've got different challenges you have to go through different things, but they were, they were life changing and somewhat mind altering challenges that you kind of went through each week that you had to do a lot of digging internally inside yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, the biggest 
thing about Warrior is don't fucking lie. You so can't where does lie. the accountability lie? When you say don't lie, who who's holding you accountable? How how does that all work? Is yeah. there a peer system? Is there is a, ultimately first line of that is yourself. And um, and then understanding when you're lying and um, and how you go through that process and you you go through a lot of self discovery in that sense um, and then there is also small um, groups where they would take guys and 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 they put me I was in a Midwest group of guys uh, that uh, it started off with about 15 of us in the group now there are five of us left and I know more about these guys than I do my own brother because. You know, we hold each other accountable, call each other out on bullshit. At the same time, we will, you know, ask each other questions. Um, I have my talent in this particular group is I, I know a lot about business. So when a guy who's running an insurance agency down in Kansas sits there and says, I just worked my ass off for three months, had the highest gross revenues I've ever had in my life, and I just got the smallest paycheck ever. And I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. So I walked him through his entire balance sheet and I go, you're losing it in this particular area. He's like, how do you know that? I'm like, just, it's a, it's just a skill, man. You know, you can learn this too, but those are the kind of things that's, it's not just, it's accountability, but it's also assistance in small group efforts. But it's, you know, we also report every single day when you got your core four done, you report in a, it's a social media site called work chat, um, where we report when we're done. So it's a little competitive then too, you know, who's the first person. Cause you know, who's got it done by eight o'clock or 10 o'clock or noon and got through their core four, which is checking off body being balance of business. Um, and then, you know, and then supporting each other dude, nice job, you know, great job getting it done by 8 a.m. I can't get that shit done by, you know, until later today, but I'm going to get it done and stay in with that program. It always kind of amazes me when we hear stories like Jeff's and people who are going through these kind of changes, how much it relates back to what we do in the gym. Mm -hmm. I was the, thinking the same thing. You know, the accountability, like if you, if you fucking lie about training it will show on the mat. It will mm -hmm. show in the gym. Mm -hmm. it, well, it will mm -hmm. show on the scale. Like you get, you get that feedback and, you know, it, getting crushed on a map because you think you've been training or you think yeah. you've been putting in the work is like, you um, can't lie. No, it's, it's impossible. And, you know, talking about accountability, right. You know, if you've got, if you've got a group of guys that are training regularly and then all of a sudden someone doesn't show up, like they're on Facebook, they're texting them like, where the hell are you? I mean, it's, it seems like, um, you know, that's a very structured, uh, your program is very structured and, you know, we, I don't know, would you say that jujitsu or the gym really kind of, it, it can be out of balance. There's, there's certain, you know, people can train too much and kind of get out of balance. But, in that. They, but they get checked too, though. Yeah, you know, true. if you pay attention to the to what's going on, I mean, you obviously had to. I mean, I mean, like if he's talking about if a guy's overtraining, mm -hmm. your performance will go down. Your performance will show. Okay. You, you may be, you may think that you're fit, but if your body's breaking down, it'll let you know. It'll it will announce itself, and you can if tell, you pay attention, just, yeah, you got it humbles you. But I think that's the beauty of of. I mean, obviously for me, I've used fitness and martial arts my whole life as my tool right. to constantly reinvent myself. Um, now I probably don't pay as much gratitude as I should because of, of what it's done for me, what it continues to do. Um, but it always fascinates me that a lot of these kind of mindset programs are so similar to what you go through anytime you put your body in a physically uncomfortable situation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and allow the process to take over. Mm -hmm. You show up, you take your lumps on the days that you get lumps. Um, much like, you know, you guys have to kind of bear your soul right. to, you know, your brother in the program. We, we do it. Um, and I think that gym sometimes can be uh, kind of a, a cauldron of, of that change taking place well yeah you know they that old saying you don't really know someone until you fought them yeah right i mean you can tell you can tell someone's personality when you're where you're in that fight right you know are they going to push extra hard are they gonna and, and the same thing for you like how many times have i had to kick my own ass because i i think after all i quit 
Like I, I didn't, they didn't beat me. I beat myself. Right. Right. And it's, it's just that constant process of trying not to beat yourself. And, right. But I think anybody that wants to change where they're at, much like you've done, much like we do at some point, you have to take ownership and responsibility mm -hmm. for where you're at right now. And if you can't figure out yourself in this day and age of social media and like how you discovered this, yeah. There's opportunity, there's people, there's resources um, available to you. I do think that we men nowadays are more capable of having those honest talks with ourselves than probably our fathers were, certainly our grandfathers were. Maybe, like yeah. that uh, kind of that emotionally stoic, void kind of I, male. I, you I, know. Do I think we're better equipped? Yes. Um, but I still think that men are as big a liars now if not more so than our than our fathers yeah. were and here's why our fathers they lied to themselves and denied themselves certain things and i think men now don't deny you know we just you know whether it's i don't whether it's sedation through alcohol or drugs whether it's pornography and masturbation i mean those are the kind of things that we all sit you know men as men say oh no i'm not that way everything's going great i've you know i've got a good job all this other stuff no you you're fucked up you mm -hmm. got places we all are fucked up someplace and it is that way first of all admit it second of all do you want to fix it and third how are you going to fix it but you, but saying this is the problem I have, I, I I tell you before I even got into this program, and I still have a couple of areas where I'm like I don't I'm not ready to cope with that yet. Mm -hmm. I'm not ready to deal with it. Um, and and I have we tell ourselves stories, but at the same time, and and especially in business, and and I think you and I chatted about this before, but. A lot of men go, oh, I, I, they build something up. They've got business and it's going great and whatever else, and then they burn it down. Right. They fuck it up. Whether And they do it with their marriage. It's, it's going great, and then they start focusing on other things, and it burns down. Well, you know what? Then they go out and find a new wife, or they start a new business or whatever else, and it goes really great, and they, burn, they build it up, and they burn it down. I know guys who've been married four or five times. Why do they think the fifth woman that they married was going to be? Oh, all, you know, all these bitches are crazy. I don't think so. No, there's a common common right. denominator. Like mm -hmm. it's it's the Bob principle. Um, you know, when Bob has a problem with Billy and Bob has a problem with John and Bob has a problem with Sally, guess who's the fucking problem? Yeah, yeah. you know, and and when a man does that and builds it up and then burns it down. And is you know he's the problem, but he's lying to himself, thinking otherwise. If as soon as he realizes that, says if you build it up, instead of burning it down, starting over because that's what you're good at and you like doing, build it up, and then go. I want to build it to there, yeah, and like, then build it to the next level, yeah. expansion, build if, it. If you're holding the Kindle and the match, <laughs> <laughs> you're fucking responsible. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's exactly. Yeah, right. and I think, man, I I really hope people. Uh, men listen to this and really take it to heart because I see it as such a big problem. I was working with a client the other day and I've been working with this client for two years and he was like, yeah, it was my birthday yesterday and I just don't have the drive to do anything. Like, I don't want to be here. I just don't want to do it. And, you know, I'm trying to help him along. I'm saying, okay, yeah. well, I mean, you're here, so you're already doing one thing that's good, that's right? That's a good start. You know, yeah. you, you could have skipped again this week like you did last week, but Jeez. at least you're here, so there's there's a spark there. And I said, you know, if your brain is telling you that you, you know, you're no good or you don't want to do something, I said, sometimes you just have to get, you just have to get your body, right? Sometimes you move, move in your body gets your mind to move. Yeah. And I mean, as, as much good advice as I could throw at him, it's, I know it's not going to stick. And yeah, I don't, sometimes they're not ready to take yeah, it on. I yeah. mean, you just, you know, um, you know, Angelo Dundee has a great saying about fighters that a coach is only as good as the guy sitting on the stool in front of him, mm. you know, and if some people are just not ready and, right. and you may see it, you know, uh, I, mean, I, I just recently read uh, Russell Brand's book, Recovery, um, because I, I was obviously as a coach, I'm always looking for better ways to become a better coach and i thought well what is the best coaching program out there it's aa mm -hmm. like if you want to take yeah. someone who's fucking broke and build them back up it's aa so i start reading the 12 steps and i was like ah eh, the whole god thing that's just not really grabbing me like and it was kind of getting in the way a little bit and then i read russell brand's version of it 
and I realized, all right, so they, they have to own it. First of all, the, f- right. the first step is going, right. yep, I'm an alcoholic yeah. and I can handle it and I don't know how to cope. And so I need a power or an influence or something that's stronger than me right. to get me do it. And, and, you know, I think that everybody who's trying to change where they're at in their life has to have that self-talk at some point mm-hmm. um, to go, yep. I, I need to do something. I need to, and if you need help, great. There's there's resources like that out there to do it. But it at some point you have to realize, yep, it's fucking me. Yeah, it's me. Well, yeah, and what what kind of struck me as as we were talking about how what he was talking about with this program is similar to what we're doing in the gym. It's a lot of different strategies for the same principle, right. or a lot mm-hmm. of different methods for the same principle. So I think really is finding the method that's going to work for you. Right. Um, is this the first kind of program like this you've ever done in your life? Or have you done any like the leadership schools or anything like that? Different, you know, different courses, different leadership things, um, lots of different professional level trainings um, and, you know, for coaching, managing, leading, all these kind of things. I've, I've always taken on leadership roles at every level, you know, high school, band, I was a drum major. Oh, okay. You know, uh, diving. So I always wanted to do those kind of things. This program took it in a way, and and I like the structure, but made it more internal fire. And in thinking about what you're saying, and and you you shared with me, you know, Goggins book can't hurt me. Mm-hmm. And in the prelude, he says, you know, motivation is bullshit. It's got to come. It's got to be in the person. And I think this program lit that fire within me that had that was going strong for a very long time. And then I had let it burn out. Um, why? I don't know. Maybe was it age? Was it getting married? Was it having kids? Was it just the you know society being able to say, oh well, okay, you're a successful businessman, so and you're married now and you got kids, so it's okay to have a dad bod, uh, or it's okay to have one too many drinks on a Friday night because you're you're a successful businessman, so it's okay. Fuck, it's not. No, it's not. Don't do that. I don't need to carry that dad bot around. It just, it kind of, I, it made that reality for me to stop lying and just face reality and take away all those other things that it's, it's okay to do. Well, no, it's not. Mm-hmm. Because to be a man and to be a warrior in this particular setting, you have to have a standard and you have to set your, hold yourself to that standard. But that standard, once you achieve it, needs to go up right it's like you say though you said earlier on about honesty yeah you know it's once you start being honest with yourself to me then okay you're you're capable of change you know you mentioned goggins goggins talks about standing in the mirror i'm overweight no you're not you're fucking fat yeah like he just says it like you're fat right like say the words you know so that it becomes more real and you you own it you know exactly yeah is there anything in Garrett's program um, that you could offer to people who maybe don't have the money to do something like this? Like, is there anything that other than like the honesty and some of the things that you've talked about and kind of the yeah. the self-talk, is there is there a huge lesson that you are still kind of um, riding high on that pops out at you from, from this program? There is... Um, uh- and I kind of, if, if anyone is interested in this, um, can I grab that book from you? Yeah. The, the kind of entry for understanding things is a book called Be the Man that you can get on Amazon for 20 bucks. Um, and it says, literally, stop lying. Garrett wanted to put on the cover, stop fucking lying, <laughs> but the publisher wouldn't let him do yeah. it. So stop lying, start leading today. There was a particular passage in this that really impacted me and has, and I still carry it with me. But, you know, and it really starts off with if you change one man, you can change a family. You change a family, you change a community, you change a community, you change a city, you change a city, you change a state, you change a state, you change a nation. If you see the society that we have and something doesn't feel right, that has to start within you. Mm -hmm. And you have to start that domino effect internally. That has always carried with me. And in the particular business I'm in, I see some great stuff in society and I see some really shitty things occur. And I 
may not be able to do anything about it right then and there, but if I'm going to make changes, I have to start that from within. And that that just makes it easier. The and if anybody's interested in the program, you can, you know, you can go through King's Kit in a couple of different versions or you can just buy the Warrior book for 100 bucks and uh, that gives you access to software that tracks your daily core four. You can read that, you get all of it. It may not be as motivating and feel the fire that you get from being an active participant in the program, but that's the operating system, man. That's that's the way it goes and that's what drives me on an everyday basis. And just just so everybody knows, like Jeff doesn't have a financial stake in this at all, and neither neither do <laughs> no. we. No. Right? We're yeah. we're kind of talking about it like yeah. salesmen, but that's just because you know it, it really impacted his life, and yeah. he wants it to to impact other I, people's lives. So I pay to be part of this program on a monthly basis. Now you've yeah. actually taken it to another level because you go off for like a weekend or yeah. uh, and like you yeah. want to actually yeah, I just got back uh, last week. Um, they, uh, there was it was called Warrior Con. It's a it's a convention and twelve hundred guys in a room in uh, um, San Diego, and uh, it, it's pretty intense. And it's three days. Goes from eight a.m. Uh, till eight nine p.m. each of those days. Actually, the last day we went all the way till one a.m. Um, and it is. It, you know, it's everything from business training, and they bring in you know former former guys who've been through the Warrior program who are now not just millionaires, billionaires. An investment banker who's gone through the program, um, who has he, he invests billions of dollars. Um, guys who the guy who runs and founded and runs ClickFunnels, um, and he's 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 a former warrior. Some of these guys. Some of them are making forty, fifty thousand dollars five years ago, and now are making forty, fifty thousand dollars a day through their business. So there are levels of expansion that you can take through this. But so going to WarriorCon was a, a full, in-depth immersion into all of that. At the same time, you know there were lots of other uh, speakers there that just you know touched your heart and connected with you and made you sit here and say, "Why am I here? What is my purpose? What do I want to do?" And that's why I'm part of that program. I mean, I took time away from work, from my family to invest in that. And it's an investment in myself, but I'm the one responsible and accountable for making it pay dividends then too. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a, that's a mentality I wish more people had and hopefully Fine. more people will get. Um, so I'm sure we could keep going on forever, forever. Um, but uh, we'll go ahead and start to wrap it up. Um, I'm going to... I'm going to find this information. I might get it from you or just look up the website. I'll sure. put links to this no uh, in the show notes for this. Of course. Um, and then also for today, um, the book of the week is going to be the one that he just outlined, Be the Man. Jeff actually brought these copies for us. Um, so thank you for that. I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, and I'll put a link to that up on our bookshelf. So book of the day is Be the Man. And then uh, when it comes to body, the first B, Mick is going to give you the workout of the week this week. All right. So, um, burpees. No, I'm yes. <laughs> yeah. Lots of them. Letter B. <laughs> yeah. Killer bunnies. We'll call them killer bunnies. Um, so this is a high intensity, low volume day. Um, and you're trying to complete all these, um, exercises. I didn't, I didn't include how much poundage, um, kilos for all our European listeners. Um, you should lift. I hope we have lots of European listeners. Um, but um, basically, we're going to start off with deadlifts. Um, if you can, uh, a trap bar is always going to be, or a T-bar is always going to be a little easier. Um, but certainly, you can use an Olympic bar. Um, four sets, a set of five, a set of four, a set of three, and a set of two. So obviously, with these um, low reps, you should be lifting quite a bit of body weight um, or quite a bit of weight as you do it. Um, a muscle snatch um, from your hips um, just to kind of modify it um, for some of the older populations that might be listening <laughs> that want to try this workout. I do modify some of these things. Um, seated lap pull downs, uh, um, pull ups, bent over rows, a jerk snatch. A jerk snatch is done with a dumbbell. And basically, you're going to swing the dumbbell up over your head um, as you kind of split your stance underneath this. So a good rule of thumb is if the dumbbell is in your right hand, as you swing it up, your right leg is going to come back um, behind you. Um, 
Uh, let me actually go back and, and talk about these sets. So deadlift, it's uh, a set of five, four, three, two. Uh, muscle snatch from the hips, four sets of eight. Lap pull downs, three sets of eight. Um, pull ups, if you can do pull ups, four sets of between three and five uh, dead man pull ups. Um, pull ups are where your hand is this way, chin ups are the other way. So we're doing pull ups. Um, a jerk snatch with a dumbbell, a set of five, a set of four, and a set of three on each arm. Uh, an incline bench press, and you can do this with an Olympic bar, or if you don't have that available, you can use dumbbells. A set of seven, five, and three. Then follow that up with uh, being on a flat bench and doing an exercise that's called a Tate press. Uh, tape press is similar to a bench press. Instead of pushing the weight straight up, you'll actually bend your elbows in. So it's much more of like a, a tricep press. Um, there's a method to my madness um, doing the exercises in this way as far as balancing movement in your body. So with the tape press, you're going to do three sets of eight. Um, and then to round it off, incline hammer curls on a bench. Um, where you're leaning back at about 45 degree angle, let the weights fully extend down by your hips, and then bring the weight from that position all the way up to your shoulders. And then to finish that off, uh, if you have it available to you, hanging abs from either straps or gymnastic rings. Um, basically, you're trying to bring your knees up into your abdomen. Uh, if you can, kind of tip your body back a little bit if you have the strength and the balance to do that. And then go back down, uh, touch the ground, and then come back up. So you're kind of folding your body up backwards um, while you hold on to either uh, uh, gymnastic rings or ropes also is another option. So a uh, high-intensity, low-volume day. Um, Real yeah. quick, what was the sets and reps for the bent over row? The bent over row, um, four sets of eight. And then also for the incline hammer curls. The incline hammer curls is also, it's three sets of eight. Right. Okay. I will put this up on the website so that uh, all those numbers are there um, uh, and you can print it out yourself. So that's the workout of the day. Uh, low rep, heavy weight. Uh, anything else, Mick, Jeff? No, it's uh, been a pleasure. I've actually known Jeff for years um, in in one of his metamorphoses. Yeah. <laughs> um, he came to the gym. How long ago was that? It was 2000, started 2006, went through about 2008 or nine. Yeah, maybe. and yeah. actually, you know, as a leader, um, he recognized that a lot of his staff needed to work out <laughs> yeah. so he was the tip of the spear and he uh yeah. brought all those yeah. guys in a lot of his staff into the gym i was like twice a week wasn't it yeah For a while. yeah um they came in as a group and uh, i think it was uh, a very cool kind of bonding experience for a lot of those guys too to yeah. kind of um and for him to lead from the front so so we've actually known yeah. each other Long quite time. a while. Yeah. And then like the prodigal son, he has returned. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and he's back at it. And yeah. I'm, I'm excited to contribute to. Oh, yeah. Sounds like for to life too. Jeff yeah, Miller no. 2.0. Oh, yeah. The new and improved upgraded version. Well, just wait. Next year is going to be 3.0. And <laughs> uh, you, you've, you've been a, a big influence in my life, my friend. Yeah, and I appreciate, appreciate that. that. And, uh, um, you know, when I start, when I, literally looked at my body i was like you know when i just gotta go back and fucking start seeing me again <laughs> <laughs> i gotta call him exactly yeah. <laughs> that well, was the hardest conversation to have to my myself yeah. <laughs> well we really appreciate you coming on and just the passion that you talk about this stuff with you got me all Thanks. jacked up now i kind of want to go to the gym right now there you go okay but uh <laughs> we'll be back in there tomorrow morning so Thanks for everybody tuning in. Remember to go to thegentlemanbadass.com. Check that out. Um, we've got merch up there. I'm actually wearing one of our new Gentleman Badass hats. If you can see, it's the distressed uh, mesh cap. I like it. It's quite Trucker comfortable. Trucker cap. Trucker cap. Um, also there, you can sign up for our mailing list. We're going to be doing some giveaways when it comes to that mailing list. Uh, not sure what those are yet, but we'll let you know. Uh, 
please subscribe to this podcast. It helps us out a lot. We want to get the word out. And if you subscribe, that helps us out quite a bit. Also, so subscribe to us on YouTube. If you want to see the, the minor demonstrations that Mick does for these exercises, um, we're kind of limited in space since we're having to talk into microphone. But if you're if you have a question about what's going on, um, you can see that on YouTube and you can also just see what we look like, um, which is always kind of fun. And then, uh, also just a reminder, uh, we've got the bookshelf on the website. So bookshelf is going to be all the books that we've recommended and links to where you can buy them. There'll be affiliate links. So, um, Oh yeah. Uh, I also, yeah. I just also want to give a shout out again to our gracious hosts for our podcasts on the guys at 88 tactical. We are, we are back in the Madison room, um, um, we are actually sitting at a table that's sitting on top of a bomber wing. How cool got is two that? 50 caliber, <laughs> 250 caliber, 250 caliber machine guns to my Josh. right. It's awesome. So, uh, <laughs> again, thank you to those guys for allowing us to use uh, their facility while we uh, while we do these podcasts. Jeff spends a lot of his time oh, yeah. and money. Yeah. Here at 88 too. I think we so, all do. Yeah. More than yeah. I care to admit. We're, <laughs> more, we're, more than my wife knows. Yes. We, uh, we support those guys and they support us. So we yeah. appreciate that. Excellent. Well, thank you for tuning in and we will see you next time.